doesn't it look fast? You look uh, great. You're looking great. Because of the, the camera, man. And then, it, and then it's got some kind of effects on it, too. That, yeah, what kind of camera is that? This is a Canon ESO M50. It's an really? M50. <laughs> I love it, man. Jeez. Yeah. Got my little lighting set up. Got my camera. As you can see, I'm in my comfortable chair. I'm doing this like I'm oh. You are doing this? You look good, eh? Yeah, good. Riding this pandemic out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pandemic, that's not stopping us. We got we got a lot of good things happening right now, Ace. I'm riding this pandemic out. I'm like, come on, come on. That's right. That's right. Always, always. Um, let's jump right in. Here we go. Hey, for y'all that just got here, it's the Ace Michaels show. I'm Ace Michaels riding this pandemic out. You see me riding it. I don't get it. Damn, I'm. Doing this and let the pandemic slow me down or stop me or nothing. Today, my guest on the show is Mr. Justin Lanning. Say it real fast. See if you can say it. Mr. Justin Lanning. Mr. Justin Lanning. Mr. Justin Lanning. Mr. Justin Lanning, music artist extraordinaire, singer, songwriter, producer, uh, award winning music artist. The great award. That's how good he is. Justin, welcome to the show, buddy. Ace, great to be back on with you, my man. Thank you so much for having me. It is always my pleasure. So you are in the process of releasing a new LP. A long playing is what we used to call it back in the day. The LP version. Long play. Oh. Baby. Yeah, no more EPs, no EPs whatsoever. We are serious artists. I've got so much music. It's exploding out of me. This month alone, I launched three albums, three LPs. Oh um, gosh, somebody's blowing me up, and um, it is. That's what happens when you release three LPs. You get oh, yeah. that. That's right, and I'm using DistroKid, and I love it. I gotta just give a shameless plug. They're not paying me, but just being an independent artist, I'm using DistroKid, and I'm able to release unlimited albums through them, and um, it's like thirty something dollars per year but I can release as many albums as I want. So that's why I kind of just took it up all the way to 11 and I released three albums in the last month. Now, is that a good thing? Should people be able to release as many albums as they want? Shouldn't there be some kind of filter? Like, mm. that's too many for you, stop. That's, we're fine, mm. we're good. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, should people be able to release as many albums as they want? That seems excessive. It, it is, but you know, it, I guess with this, with the modern day, it allows artists like myself to not be constrained by those typical constraints of other distribution platforms. Because yes, being a part of a, you know, record label in the past, there was a, a limit, you know, because they want to have a shelf life for the music and, um, you know, they want to space it out every 18 months. And um, Prince had an issue similar to this where he was releasing so much music through Warner Brothers that essentially they told him, you can't, you can't keep releasing music like this. You're going to devalue everything that we've been doing. And that's why Prince had a big issue with, with Warner Brothers. Um, so I bet Prince would have really loved DistroKid because it really enables me to just not have that filter. It completely removes it and you know, just allows me to focus on my creative drive. And I've got at least another five albums in the works right now. But now, speaking of Prince, I, I happen to agree that some of Prince's releases were a bit ex ex excessive. You know, I'm kind of glad that somebody did reel it back in because now I listen to cuts that uh, weren't released when Prince was alive because now you can hear everything, you know. And it's kind of like, I find myself fast forwarding through Prince songs when I used to never did uh, do that. I used to love to listen mm -hmm. from beginning to end of the album and backwards to forwards. And I think that's because somebody was standing there going, hey, a little filter. I mean, just like anything else, like if you write a novel, you have an editor, you know, yeah. and sometimes the editor goes through and redlines certain sections and, you know, really, 
we got your prowess in the bedroom. We don't need three more pages, babies. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a good thing to have a filter. Maybe not. But in your case, you just released three albums. How many tracks on these albums? Um, one of them has 13 tracks. One of them has 14 tracks. And I believe the other one has 12 tracks. So how do you know when you're done with an album? What At what point does something happen to you? Like, does your hair curl up at the ends or something? How do you feel? How do you know you're done? You say, oh, this album is complete. You know, I have, it, it starts with a lot of folders, okay? Because first, before I get to an album, I have stages of songs that have kind of moved forward. And um, really my, I have something called an idea library, okay? And I basically start kind of reverse engineering an album. I say, okay, this album, I want it to kind of feel like this or have a certain kind of vibe or a certain kind of overall theme. And I really try to describe that in two words or less. And that actually helps me a lot with song themes. I kind of apply that same mentality. And I guess you just, you know when it's done. That's all I could say is, you know, it, it, it kind of, it kind of just forms naturally by itself with a lot of work that goes up to that point. But once I, I then put everything into iTunes and I create playlists and I kind of mix and match different songs, different, you know, I, I, I go from song to song, listening, um, you know, from the ending of one song into the intro of another because I want it all to be cohesive and flowing and ultimately storytelling. Um, and what you said about an editor is absolutely true and, and right. Um, for me though, I've been through that process so many times of having an editor, having somebody censor me and, and that's what didn't work for me. So now I've just gotten to the point where I've got a good ear. I know, well, actually, the, the truth is, I, I put myself in my fans' shoes. I was not going to release a particular song on an, on one of the current releases called Bleed. Because I thought, you know, lyrically, it didn't, um, it didn't show the kind of qualities that I wanted to talk about as a singer-songwriter. But the truth is, it was from, you know, when I was younger in life 21 22 and um it, it was about a love triangle okay and because of the subject matter of the song i wasn't gonna put it in because i didn't want that in there but a fan just said out of nowhere oh you know i love this song bleed that's my favorite song and i said really because you said out of nowhere this person yeah i love the song bleed because of that i changed rearranged the whole album and I put it on there. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there sometimes censor, censorship is not a good thing because I, I, I just do my best to get out of the way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, it's all about the fans. It, it, you know, there's been so many people that, that have literally tried to censor me, to, to, to quiet me, to shut me down, mm -hmm. you know, I've had people say, you know what, your music is so great and everything, but just just delete it all and you know let let's start fresh. And to be honest with you, and all the viewers, I I actually did that in the past. I I took that plunge because I I have such such deep artistic, um, a, a deep artistic need to want to please and, and to just want to put out the best thing humanly possible. However, that type of censorship ultimately hurt me as an artist because what I realized, I'm robbing the fans. If I were to just keep, you know, shelving my music, um, you know, because it didn't fit the right, you know, theme that I'm going for, you know, as I'm evolving, Ultimately, I would be robbing the people that that get healing from music. You know, I've really one of the things that I got recently was some beautiful fan mail, and and that's why I just stayed up for days releasing this music because somebody said, Justin, you know, 
you don't know me. Um, I haven't written you any messages, but I've always kind of followed you. And I want you to know I've listened to your music over the years and it really helped me get through some difficult times. And when I read that message, I was like, you know what? This is why I'm doing what I do. This is why, you know, no matter what life throws at me, I just keep going back and I say, you know what? It's about the fans. The music isn't about me. I'm just a channel. You know, I don't know how, how I can come up with all this music and do all the instrumentation and the production and the engineering and all the A&R and the artwork. The, the, the truth is, I'm just a channel. And who am I to stand in the way of that? Who am I? Who, who is somebody else to censor me? Because then if, the, if they were successful in censoring me, then that fan who needed my music at that time in their life, that would have prevented their healing. So I've just kind of, you know, gone deeper, um, opened my heart more to the fact that the music is not mine. I'm, I'm a channel. I kind of tune in like a radio station. You know what I mean? I'll just sit at the piano and this stuff really naturally just comes out of me. And I'm very grateful. I thank God. I say, thank you, Lord, because you know what? You've given me gifts. You've given me blessings. And you know what? The fans have spoken. People say, Justin, I love your music. It's healing me. It's helped me get through a difficult time. And I say, you know what? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Um, you know, Justin, you're an artist who went through the recording industry system. You know, and um, I had read an article that, first off, for people who don't know, record labels put clauses in your contract that say that you can't re-record your songs, you can't recut. Once you deliver the master to them, they own the master, and the master is theirs. So you can't go back. For example, I believe the names that came up were David Bowie, Prince, of course, uh, and Robert Plant, I believe, uh, wanted to... Mm -hmm all three of these artists at different times and bands wanted to go back into the studio to say, wait a minute, you know, Changes by David Bowie, I'm a better singer than that now. Let me recut my vocals. The way that I could do it now is much better than the way I did it 10 years ago. So let me just recut the vocals and we re-release the record. And, uh, my question to you, Justin, is do you think that's a bad idea that record labels don't allow that? Or do you think that uh, that's a good idea? I personally think it's a good idea that they don't allow that. I, I think what you delivered in 77 is what you were, where you were at. There's no going back in 87 and recutting. Besides that, we're in 2020 anyway, so you can't do that anyway. You'd have to recut it in 2030, and you're too old to recut it in 2030. So that's the end of the conversation. Man, I thought about that before. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, well, your question has a couple different layers to it. That's first, right. That's how I roll. That's how I roll. <laughs> okay, so let me try to break it down a little bit. So, essentially, you're talking about censorship. You're talking about when an artist like David Bowie completes the recording and delivers the record, boom, yes. He then has lost, what, it's even before then, when he signed on that dotted line, he signed his music rights away. He, he signed a contract saying that when, when I deliver this, I don't, get a I don't get a say in kind of changing things or doing a remix. I, on the other hand, see, I, I went through exactly what David Bowie went through, except my record label screwed me, boy. Whew. SMC Recordings, Mesa Blue Moon Records, I'm not afraid to say their name. They screwed me in the ass without Vaseline. And I'm telling my story. It's going to be in my book. I, I'm holding nothing back. But here's the good news. So because they screwed me so, so royally, I had an option. And, and I don't agree with my attorney looking back. I should have sued the piss. I should have sued them forever. But instead, my attorney said, you know what? Let's just settle. You're never going to collect any money from them. They're crooks anyways. Why don't I just get you your music back and we'll call it a day. I was a young kid and I said, well, 
sounds good. I get my music. Here's the here's the point that I'm trying to make. I believe artists ultimately should have that control. Artists should be able. And why why do I say that? Because it's all about the fans. See, my the next step for future albums and even for select songs on the albums that I just released, my goal is to release the masters to the public, meaning the separated audio tracks. I want the fans to put that in GarageBand. I want the fans to make their own remixes. You know, I want to give that ability to the fans. See, a, rec a, a big record label would never allow that. A big record label would only selectively allow those master tracks to be delivered to certain remixers that kind of fit the bill of what they're going for, you know, for a dance remix, for example. Yeah. Um, and they work with the specific DJs. It's kind of, you know, boys in the club kind of thing. And that's okay. I'm not against that part. Um, I guess we're, what I'm trying to say is ultimately it's about the fans. See, I believe in just kind of giving the music away because the truth is most people don't even value music enough to pay for it in the first place. Um, I mean, I remember being a street performer, getting, you know, I played my heart out. I lugged so much equipment and, you know, people would give me a dollar or two dollars and I would be very grateful, but I'd go back to my home at the end of the day and say, you know, this is not a sustainable business model. Right. You know what I mean? I got to figure, I got to rework this. I got to figure this out to make sense because um, it didn't make sense like that. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I believe in kind of flipping it and creating a new paradigm where it's just give the music away practically. I mean, the, the lowest price point on DistroKid is $5.99 for an LP. I would have gone lower if it would have allowed me to go lower, but I just put it at the bare minimum, 69 cents per song and I'm going to figure out a way to just give it away. And, and hopefully the, the true and honest fans will still buy the music because they want to support a, a hardworking artist that, that really makes it about the fans. See, that, that's where my whole direction is. I just want to connect with people. When I get those messages in the middle of the night, and, you know, it's tough. You know, sometimes my... I put my dog to sleep. That that alone caused me such heartbreak and trauma, you know, and he was old and he was suffering, but still it's a painful thing. So what do I do? I go to my piano and I cry into my piano. Paul McCartney taught me that. He's one of my great, great idols that love Paul McCartney. So the Beatles are my ultimate favorite group. And to be able to cry into the piano and to be able to record that and to be able to, um, convey a message and then when I'm just you know alone pissed off sad or whatever and I get that message that that ray of light that comes from a fan and says hey Justin you don't know me but you've helped me your music helped me get through a dark time that's what it's about you know it's about connection and ultimately look I guess most most record labels want to have that type of censorship because it gives them the control and then they can kind of, you know, figure out the album cycle and, and you know, meticulously monetize that recording, which they put up in advance for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, rightfully so. They, they need to, you know, recoup their monies. But being an independent artist now who's been through that whole nightmare... I'm bypassing that whole thing completely. It's all about the fans. The fans want music and they want great music. You know, just, you know, I, I'm very, very selective with the, the stuff that I put on an album and the stuff that I selectively develop. And um, I, I believe my fans know that. So I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just proud to say that I have a, a small dedicated core group of, of fans that I, I would rather have a hundred diehard fans that are crazy JL than you know 10,000 people that are not really they're kind you know yeah they're cool but they're not really super in it I just want that connection you know 
that's what that's what keeps me going that's what heals my heart from you know just the the pains of the world well we, on the show i've got time for one more question and it it seems to me that creativity versus censorship is always going to be an issue now very recently uh last summer we got to enjoy the final star wars and the problem with the final star wars was that when the Disney Corporation purchased the Star Wars story from George Lucas, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted creatively with his story. And what they did creatively was they changed the ending of the story so much that it no longer fit the beginning of the story. And there wasn't a big hoopla about it, but I always thought that there should have been more and there probably will be more in the future because the true question in that scenario is how much creative control should the corporation get to change or censor what the artist did? Now, you gave an interesting scenario where you said, well, if people, if your fans could have the open tracks and maybe they could add a guitar solo or maybe they could change a bass line, but would that be what you want for the Mona Lisa? What if the Mona Lisa was open in the museum for you to add whatever graffiti you wanted to it and some guy came along and he changed it. What, and what one person considered art, another person might consider defacing, right? So right. It's, a, it's a huge question. How much creative control should the artists keep versus the corporation who's paid money for this work of art? You know, Quentin Tarantino caught flack the last few films he put out because they're three plus hours long. And right. the companies say, look, man, you know, we could tell the same Django chain story in two hours as opposed to three and a half. It doesn't have to be three and a half. By making it three and a half, you're losing us a lot of money. Should they, that corporation be able to go in and say, you know what, we're just going to cut these scenes out. We're going to do this. Matter of fact, we're going to take our camcorder and we're going to film a scene that we think should have been in there and just insert it. Well, gosh, again, you asked a question that has so many layers to it. So regarding Star Wars, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And I have to say, I was a little disappointed in that. A little? Well, you know, I hope to be in Star Wars one day, so I don't want to talk too much smack about it. But, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it was painful to watch that, that last one. You know, I, I couldn't believe it, to be honest with you. But that's neither here nor there. Um, regarding censorship, okay, here's, here's the ultimate question. Is it, what, what is it about? If you're talking about music or film, um, what is the end result that, that one is, is trying to achieve? If it's about creating something that moves people, then I feel like a corporation actually could be helpful because look, to be an artist in today's age, there's so many influences, there's so many factors um, and, 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 you know, A&R people can be very, very helpful in, in shaping an early artist that, that doesn't kind of know what, what direction. Um, that can be helpful to kind of have a, a track or a shape or, I, I hate to say censorship, but they're, they're, that implies some level of censorship. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding Quentin Tarantino, um, I think he's brilliant, and I, I love his work, mm -hmm. and I enjoy his three-hour movies. And yeah, of course, the studio is going to bitch and moan because every minute costs more money. Right. Now, I guess my take on it is it's, it's very hard to find the balance. For me, personally, I love full creative control. I've had the censorship. I've been kind of guided. I've had people talking in my ear. And at this point in my life and at this stage in my career, I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody to tell me anything um, because I, 
I feel like I've found myself as an artist. And that's really the most important thing is to be able to really say, yes, I found myself as an artist. I don't, you know, I don't need anybody's help. I don't want it. It doesn't help because I'm so, I'm so strong in my convictions that I know what the hell I'm doing. And if you like it or love it or hate it, great. I don't care because you know what? I love what I'm doing and I have those small, small core of people that have stuck by me. And I guess what I'm trying to say is once an artist finds themselves, go bananas, have no censorship. You know what I mean? <laughs> because there, but there's a point where you, it's hard to find yourself as an artist because you find yourself balancing all kinds of stuff such as money and, you know, scheduling and, and just real life stuff that totally gets in the way. So you have to start to balance, okay, well, what's important? How do we get to the end result of having a product that we can sell that also is able to kind of transcend the norms that have been kind of put on us by society. I mean, if you think about it, the music business before the whole downloading thing, you know, it was on fire. The CD sales, it was an, a new industry was born. Okay. And the money was astronomical. In some ways today, it's even better, but the, the, I'm getting a little off topic, but I guess what I'm trying to say, find yourself as an artist and everything else will become clear. And that is what's up. I think that's the closing word for the show. Find yourself as an artist and everything else will come clear. My guest today, Justin Lanning. Justin, how do we stalk you on the internet? We want to follow you, baby. Follow me at Justin Lanning on Instagram, at Justin Lanning on Twitter, justinlanning.com, facebook.com slash Justin Lanning. You can find me anywhere. Send me a telegram. Send me a fire signal. I'd love to hear from you. I'm, I'm sensing a pattern here. It's Justin Lanning. Ace Michael Show, man. Justin Lanning. Go to justinlanning.com. Check my man um, out. Got three albums. That is a lot of love making, y'all. Three albums my man didn't put out. Okay? Put that on repeat, peep, 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 peep. It's Ace Michael Show. And you know what I say? Live the life you love. Love the life you live. Thank you.